Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be taking a serious look at religious miracles. My guest is Dr. Michael Grosso, a friend (laughs) since the mid-1970s when uh, he first wrote a book review of my book, The Roots of Consciousness. Michael is the author of many books. He was recently interviewed about The Man Who Could Fly, St. Joseph of Copertino and the Mystery of Levitation. His other titles include Wings of Ecstasy, Domenico Bernini's Vita of St. Joseph of Copertino, The Final Choice, Death or Transcendence, Experiencing the Next World Now, Frontiers of the Soul, The Millennium Myth, Love and Death at the End of Time, Soul Making, Uncommon Paths to Self-Understanding, Soul Maker, True Stories from the Far Side of the Psyche, Irreducible Mind Toward a Psychology for the 21st Century. His most recent book, the one we'll be focusing on today, is called Smile of the Universe, Miracles in an Age of Disbelief. Because this is an internet interview, I'll be switching over to the internet video. Welcome, Michael. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. Well, I'm delighted to be here. You've written so many books that cover uh, some of the more extreme manifestations of parapsychology, but I I suppose when it comes to religious miracles, they are, are very often off the charts in terms of the things that parapsychologists usually encounter. Yes, you're absolutely right, and that's the reason why I picked on them, so to speak. Uh, I I felt that, uh, well, my rule was, unless there were strong, unless there was strong evidence for these really weird and fantastic manifestations, I wasn't going to have anything to do with it. Uh, Or if I would, I would be explicit about saying that this is something that touches my imagination, but the evidence is weak. But it turns out that a lot of the very striking phenomena, extreme manifestations, are well documented. Uh, And uh, so I feel, I felt, after I wrote my book on um, uh, Joseph Copertino and focused on the extreme phenomenon of levitation, for which there was extremely all kinds of evidence, powerful evidence, from there I went on to explore other uh, miraculous phenomena uh, and um, uh, came up with the book that uh, we're we're discussing, we're going to discuss. And I did that because I feel that these really powerful phenomena, even though they're a bit maybe um, alarming to the more um, uh, conservative scientific mind, I understand that, uh, I'm not a scientist. I'm a philosopher by training, and so I don't have. I'm not worried about my career in science, uh, and I, I feel that the really powerful, extraordinary phenomena should not be ignored. You r- describe a, a situation where you were, in, in effect, a witness to what was regarded as a religious miracle uh, back. Uh, several decades ago, a a statue that began crying or weeping. Right. Back in the 1990s, uh, I I heard on the news about a uh, a Greek uh, Orthodox church in Astoria, which I happened to have been born in, (laughs) in that town, right? And uh, I, I was move to get on. I was living in, in Manhattan, uh, so I got on a train and I went and I paid a visit. Uh, and I got there and there was crowds of people and I was able to go right up in front of the statue and see with my own eyes that there were, it was gushing tears. And then I met a, uh, a one of the religious uh, professionals who was there and he told me 
the story that this is this uh, had been uh, weeping, if you will, several times in the past. And every time that it happened, it was an indication or a sign or construed as an indication of something terrible happening, usually in the near in the Middle East. But anyway, whatever the background was, I did witness that particular uh, unusual phenomenon. And uh, so I, I, as it turns out, which I mentioned, I, I'll begin the book with that example. But as it turns out, I've discovered that in the 1990s, there were reports all over the world of statues, particularly of the Madonna, that were weeping, and also statues of Jesus that were bleeding. And however bizarre and strange that sounds, uh, I got into it uh, researching. I went. I, I discovered it, it goes back to at least the 12th century, where one of the first bleeding uh, uh, statues was reported. And uh, so um, I felt I wanted to uh, explore that uh, that phenomenon. Uh, something has to do with the symbols, its powerful symbols that seem to be often, not all the time, but often associated with some of the most extravagant manifestations of the paranormal. So it's the symbolism and the belief systems that are somehow generating these phenomena. And hence, uh, I, I've spent a lot of time exploring that aspect of miracles. Well, one of the things you point out is is that uh, on occasion when statues are bleeding or or weeping, they've actually been scientists on the scene who did chemical analysis of the substance that was oozing out of these statues. Right. That was done uh, famously in Italy in, in uh, uh, 1953 when a statue in Syracuse, Italy, began weeping in the house of two people who were not religious at all, but there was a statue uh, on the wall, and it turns out that the woman who owned the statue, her husband was a communist and anti-religious. So that's a puzzling aspect of the story. By the time he got home on that day, uh, when this uh, statue uh, began to uh, weep, there were crowds of people, and by the end of the day, it was all over the world. It was in the news. I don't remember noticing it in 1953. I was alive then, by the way. Uh, but uh, so that and that was thoroughly stu studied almost immediately by a bunch of doctors that came right on the scene. And they were very careful the way they phrased it. They said, this liquid has all the properties of human tears. And, uh, you know, that's it. It, it, it. it went on for four days, that particular phenomenon. Uh, and uh, it, you know, impressed a lot of people. And I, I don't know what effect it had on the communist uh, uh, husband there. But, the, but there was also a healing involved because the woman whose statue it was was pregnant and ill. She was, as far as I could make out from the symptoms, hysterical. Uh, she was uh, uh, notably temporarily blind, for example, hysterically blind. And maybe it had to do with the fact that she was pregnant uh, before she was married or something like that, but they didn't talk about that. But after the statue began to uh, weep and she noticed it, she was immediately healed. Everything that was troubling her phys physiologically seemed to disappear. So that's an interesting, uh, uh, very well-known case where the scientists came on the scene immediately and checked it out. But it's not the only one because they're, they're taking, it's taking place in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, fairly recently. There's a case that I investigated. So for some reason, these, uh, Madonna is uh, very unhappy. She's just crying all over the place uh, in, in country, in Russia, in Lithuania. Uh, but it's just an interesting phenomenon, and uh, I don't know how to explain it, but it is taking place. Uh, some of the other analyses had to do with human blood coming uh, from these statues, as I recall. 
Yes, uh, it tends to be more often uh, the Jesus uh, figure. Blood is, of course, a very powerful symbol to begin with. But once again, uh, many of these cases uh, have been investigated, uh, and uh, the evidence is quite clear that uh, barring some fraud that's going on, that, that no one has been able to catch them at it, that uh, it's real blood that that seems to be materialized in some of the uh, um, of the materialization of tears it's just water for example the case in in washington as far as i could make out uh numerous statues and numerous people witnessed the tears form but when they were analyzed they did not have the properties of of uh, of, of tears but they were water so whether it's water or tears that's being materialized You've got something unusually paranormal. Well, you point out that by definition, a religious miracle occurs in a religious context. Right. It, it, parapsychologists are accustomed to seeing very unusual phenomena in a completely different context, uh, such as the poltergeist case, uh, where you get very dramatic uh, phenomen, phenomena, phenomenology, but, but of a different nature. The, uh, the meanings attributed are completely different if it's a poltergeist case. Yes. And, you know, and the way I handle this in my book, uh, since I'm not a, a believer, frankly, uh, I, uh, and, um, I simply say that the word miracle is often used uh, to indicate the intervention of God producing the effect. Uh, and that may be true. I don't know. I'm just interested in recording the fact that a supernormal phenomenon has taken place. And the explanation, uh, the ultimate explanation is at this moment beyond me and beyond all science. But I'm, I'm not necessarily pushing a religious interpretation, except to say that it could be the intensity of religious belief that is a, uh, a driving a variable here that tends to produce these eff effects. But as for uh, the ultimate uh, question about the divine reality, uh, that's another question, and I uh, abstain from discussing that. Well, one thing you do point out is is that virtually all religions have uh, mir miracle stories associated with them. They're, I don't know that any one religion has a monopoly on miracles. I, I absolutely agree with you, and I do try to include as as great a variety as as possible. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, there, there's one thing about the the the, the Catholic uh, tradition of miracles that's interesting, and that is they have a tradition, a legalistic propensity, uh, duty, if you will, to examine these phenomena and find out if they're really real. They don't just uh, get. To, I mean, as some people might imagine that. The Catholic Church just jumps on every miracle and uses it to prove that they are a great religion. That doesn't work like that way at all. They're very, very cautious and very careful about making sure that these phenomena are authentic. So that's one reason. So there's you have that tradition. And the other point about uh, Christianity is that from the very beginning, it's a miracle-mediated uh, religion, more almost more than most, perhaps, I don't know. Uh, it, be, it begins with uh, all kinds of extraordinary uh, supernatural claims. So there is that tradition, in, in the, particularly in the Catholic, not the Protestant. Uh, one, it's been pointed out by a number of scholars that after the Protestant Reformation, uh, the Protestant, the leaders of, that, of, the, of the Reformation felt that miracles only occurred in biblical times not in modern times, which is a completely absurd and uh, arbitrary judgment in my judgment, in my opinion. And uh, whereas the, the Catholic Church did not uh, swallow that idea at all and maintained their openness. And so have other religions. I mean, I have in the book some examples of uh, 
Indians that uh, rather have miracles that took place in India or related to uh, 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 Indian belief systems. So, but you're quite right. I, I don't believe that there's any special, um, unique association between miracles in any one religion. Uh, or and I, I think that shamans, uh, mediums, uh, extraordinary phenomena uh, emerge out of all kinds of traditions and all kinds of people, whether they're religious or not religious. Uh, and even when they're not even th in any unusual state of mind. Uh, uh, so there's something arbitrary about the manifestation of the supernormal. Uh, the more I study it as I go along, but uh, we tend to notice certain phenomena more readily than others. Uh, but um, anyway, that's my view of that. I'm under the impression that in your book, you're really uh, endeavoring to address the question of did these things actually happen or not, uh, as opposed to uh, the question of, you know, what does it mean? What is the sociological or theological significance or psychological significance? You're, you're trying to get at uh, the question, you know, is it all fantasy or fraud, or could there be uh, some sort of naturalistic uh, or even supernaturalistic, but at least ontological, uh, real basis for th these phenomena? Well, I, absolutely. I, I mean, that's one of my main conclusions of the book. Uh, not very spectacular, but yeah, miracles are real. But I do, uh, I am interested in the conditions that give rise to them and, and the manner in which they seem to respond to human needs. And another big theme uh, that I have uh, is that I, don't, I only touch on it throughout, but it's in the back of my mind all of the time. And that is I'm wondering whether or not these phenomena uh, imply something about human evolution. I mean, what on earth are we, why are these things happening? Uh, it, it is uh, strange. Why, it, it, it's very curious about uh, ESP, for example. It's not very useful in life. I mean, there are examples and cases where it does serve a purpose and it can be helpful, but you can't rely on it. And there is, there are no physical organs that we can refer to to account for their existence. So there's something added, uh, additional about the whole range of these phenomena. And the question is, why do we have these abilities? Uh, and so I have some speculations on that too, if you want to get into that. Sure, let's, let's hear your speculation. I've often wondered uh, whether that uh, or speculated on the possibility of the reason we have psi abilities, uh, which are obviously not reliable and, or, or even learnable, really, in, in our embodied existence. But they may very well be the basis of a post-mortem existence. If when, when we are released from our bodies, when we shed our bodies, uh, our minds which are not reducible to our bodies and our minds, which possess these apparently unusual abilities, uh, would then become the basis of our post-mortem existence. Uh, so I think that someone asked me recently, to, uh, what effect does miracles, the way you conceive of them, what are the implications for post-mortem survival? And my reply is that uh, although they don't directly indicate that anyone has survived death, they do seem to suggest that the human mind, the human psyche, has extraordinary causal efficacy sufficient uh, to uh, render the mind an autonomous entity that survives the death of the body. So indirectly, my entire book, in a way, is a, uh, is a makes a case for survival. I think I say that somewhere. 
uh, I don't remember everything I write. I have to go back and read my own books to remember what I've said. But I think I do discuss that, and it's something I want to go further into. I want to write a, a serious paper on that very theme and argue that indirectly, extraordinary PK phenomena uh, do suggest or amplify the basis for a belief in postmortem survival. You do invoke the concept of the one mind that may be responsible behind the scenes for a, a wide variety of uh, paranormal manifestations, including miracles. Yes, it's true. I, I, I have gradually evolved that my belief in the one mind, the big mind, I, I call it. Uh, when I first got into the study of the paranormal, I thought to myself, okay, our minds are byproducts of our brains, but the mind somehow can do these amazing things, but, it, but, but it's ultimately dependent on the brain. And I no longer believe that. Uh, you know, Ed and the whole gang of us, we wrote this book called Irreducible Mind to argue in great detail, and not just me, but many others, uh, that the mind itself is not reducible to the brain. The, there are correlations, uh, interactions, causal connections, but they're two different kinds of entity. And so that, for my money, is already a philosophical argument that points in the direction of survival. If my mind is not something that is the product of my brain, I have to somehow assume, I'm tempted to assume, we'll put it that way, that it pre-exists my mind, uh, my, 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 my brain, and from where does it draw its essence? Well, a larger, independent mind. Uh, I was very much impressed by uh, Schroding, Schrodinger's argument in his wonderful essay on the nature of mind, where he says, mind has to be one thing, and, and, and it brought me back to an argument that, of, of Plato's, uh, who said of something rather similar. The, the mind is not, you can't break up the mind into, into its components, uh, it, it's one. And if my mind is one, it seems entirely plausible to suggest that all our minds are part of one mind. And the variety of mental experience is a byproduct of our individual forms of embodiment. And the, the way that our minds are become interpreted and manifested depends on what period of history we're talking about, uh, the, the belief systems involved, uh, the nature of the, the, of the brain, the state of the brain, it could, if, if its diseases, its health or whatever. But the idea of the one mind is a sort of a, a late uh, view that I've arrived at, and that uh, I think helps me understand the big picture a little better. Well, it sounds sort of consistent with uh, Vedantic uh, philosophy, which is very ancient. Yes, it, it, it is. And the, uh, I'm a, uh, uh, like Schrodinger, a student of the Upanishads. And uh, that, uh, it is a um, definitely a fundamental insight. But that fundamental insight into the one mind is a recurrent uh, effect in, in a variety of, of philosophical and spiritual traditions, and even scientific traditions, uh, i.e., uh, our friend uh, Schrodinger, and uh, contemporary people like L Larry uh, Dossi has written a, a wonderful book on the one mind. And what he does there, as you probably know, I'm sure you've looked at the book, he has all these wonderful stories illustrating concretely in what sense uh, it, it's plausible and reasonable to talk about the one mind underlying a vast variety of, 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 of unusual phenomena. So yes, uh, I'm a one-minder these days.
Back to religious miracles. Now, we had a wonderful discussion uh, just under two years ago about the levitations of Joseph of Copertino and the uh, very rigorous procedures the, that were developed within the Catholic Church for evaluating these claims and how uh, the the cardinal uh, at the time who was in charge of this investigation uh, didn't really want to proclaim uh, this individual as as a saint he uh, uh, was controversial and the church would have rather just shoved the phenomenon away uh, but they've also developed very rigorous methodologies for analyzing cases of healing especially associated with uh, the site at lords that's another aspect of my of my interest and uh, there's a case that has really Impressed, but there are many cases, but from from Lourdes, uh, but the one that really impresses me is the story of Pierre de Ruda. Uh, this was a man who broke his leg, and for eight years it never quite healed. It was a suppurating, infected thing, and he was taken care of by a very uh, rich family. Uh, his poor family was taken in by a rich family who brought the best doctors on the scene to get to see if they could help uh, Pierre's uh, 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 healing, but no one was able to do it. He, for eight years, longed to go to uh, Lourdes and try his luck with the Madonna. And his, the, the people who were supporting him were skeptical about that, and they never allowed it to happen. Finally, after eight years, they did. They said, all right, you want to go? Uh, we will arrange that you can travel there with your wife. And, and, uh, and so he did. And almost immediately upon arriving at, at a place called Ustaka, where there was a statue of the Madonna, he immediately had, spoke a prayer out loud. And it was a very simple prayer. Just help me so that I can work and help my family. That was the prayer. And believe it or not, and it's hard to believe, but it, uh, instantly, his, he was healed completely. And he was completely shocked and went back. The, the beautiful thing about this story is that everybody knew about what he was doing. All the doctors knew that they had tried to heal him. And instantaneously, he was completely healed. Normally, if, uh, uh, by the way, after he died, uh, they were able to photograph the, 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 the leg, and, the, and you could see a strip about two inches thick of pure white bone, the new bone that was materialized uh, after that illness. And at any rate, it was uh, quite, a, quite a story, uh, and, and uh, it created a, a furor all over the place. And there were lots of people who just didn't want to believe it, uh, and uh, for obvious reasons, because uh, rather like uh, David Hume didn't want to accept the reality of miracles, because it would seem that would seem to validate papism, the horrible, diabolical thing called the Pope and the Catholic Church. So that's the reason that they resisted uh, admitting the reality of these miracles. But the, the case of Pierre de Rude, and there are others, uh, all kinds of, Padre Peel has some interesting stories of uh, well-documented healings. So yes, the, uh, we're talking about um, very extraordinary kinds of healings uh, that, are, that come under the heading of, uh, of uh, the paranormal or the miraculous, if you will. And in this case, I gather he didn't even make it all the way to Lourdes. The healing uh, occurred before he got there. That's right. In a little town uh, called Ustaka, uh, I think that's the correct name for it. Uh, exactly. He didn't actually get to Lourdes, but it was sort of on the outskirts. And there was a statue of, of the Madonna, and that was enough for him uh, to, uh, uh, to make the attempt at any rate. Uh, it's so interesting. I, I'm I'm a painter, uh, as someone might notice behind me, but I'm interested in the in the interaction between uh, art and and the paranormal. I mean, the, the statues that bleed and weep, 
uh, and statues that you pray to and you're instantly healed. Uh, what's going on? <laughs> I mean, it's a strange connection here between art and the uh, creation of unusual paranormal events. Apparitions of uh, the Madonna are also uh, another common form of miraculous occurrence. As I recall, uh, the apparitions that appeared in Zaitun, Egypt, uh, were seen simultaneously by thousands of people, and, and they kept recurring over and over again for many months. Isn't that correct? Actually, three years it went on, and uh, that's a very unique uh, instance of a of a Marian vision. Uh, it it began, I think, in 1969, uh, and went on uh, to 1971. It it continued. Uh, often, uh, uh, the Madonna or an apparition, a light form, would appear on the dome of the of the church of Saint Mary's. And it would float around and bow to the people. And uh, every night there were thousands of people. Now, what I find so interesting about that story is that uh, the Christians and the Arabs stopped uh, hating each other, so to speak. And as long as that Madonna was appearing, uh, both, and, and there were reports of Jewish people also who witnessed it. Uh, and um, so somehow th that manifestation had an extraordinarily uh, peace-giving effect on, 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 the, on, on people. And there were, again, reported healings. I, in I interviewed six people in, in Jersey City, where at that time I was teaching, and I uh, spoke to... Uh, uh, these people who witnessed, they, they were there and they witnessed it. But one of the interesting things I learned about that interview was that there was one of the women that was there was right in the midst of it all and she saw nothing. Now, the question arises, what kind of a phenomenon can be photographed? Because this particular man, uh, Madonna manifestation was photographed and I have photographs of it, can be seen by most people but not by some other people. That makes it even more puzzling, it seems to me. But uh, it, that, that is uh, one of the more striking um, uh, Marian visions. The other one if, uh, that blows my mind completely is Fatima, where uh, the, the Madonna was invisible, except to three children. And the first time she appeared, she said, come back here every month for six months. And on the last time that I appear, I'm going to prove to everybody something totally fantastic. You know, that's, those are my words. And so, indeed, uh, it happened. Each month they would come back and the crowds would increase and, and uh, there was all kinds of things would be taking place. But the great miracle took place on the last day. In 1917, it was a day that there was a World Series going on in, in New York City. I remember that, reading about that. And on that last day, uh, was, uh, there were 70,000 witnesses prepared to observe uh, this so-called uh, miracle. It was a very cloudy, a, a rainy day. And suddenly, after uh, apparently the Madonna appeared to the three children, and soon after that, the sky suddenly cleared, and there was the so-called miracle of the sun, in which the witnesses saw what looked like a the sun vibrating and moving about in its place, and then descended in a zigzag UFO-like pattern, by the way, uh, and down downward, and then went back up. Uh, it was, uh, apparently the ground dried up immediately. People saw it hundreds of miles away. There were instantaneous healings. Uh, and, uh, and that was it. That was the culmination. It's one of the more amazing uh, stories. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, there was a prediction that something was going to happen, and it did happen. Uh, what makes this particular miracle story interesting to me is the overlap with the phenomenology of UFOs. Uh, so it's, I'm not the only person that noticed that overlap, by the way. I also have a speculative sense that the Zeitoon phenomenon, uh, what may have been, I hate to use the word engineered by some unknown agency, uh, there was something to my mind mechanical about the manifestation of the Mary light vision. So for example, sometimes you just see her face and her shoulders as though the mechanism, whatever it was, that was producing the apparition wasn't working quite that well. Now, that could have been explained psychologically or just conceivable. It's just conceivable that there's some kind of technology involved associated with UFOs or UAPs, as they're called now, unidentified aerial phenomena. And... Uh, that makes it all the more bizarre and complicated. But it is true that UFO phenomena, uh, uh, so-called UFO phenomena, are often linked up with uh, PK effects, lots of levitation stories, and telepathy is rampant in stories of uh, alien uh, encounters and alien abductions. So it makes things even more mysterious and challenging to us, don't you think? <laughs> Well, you know, Michael, I might just mention in passing, I know you don't deal with this in, in your book, but there is a new hypothesis floating around based on video games that we're, we're living in a simulated reality that there's, uh, you know, that maybe from a higher dimension or maybe it's something that uh, uh, consciousness, the one mind is involved in, but it certainly does appear from these many stories that the, the physical reality that we think of as, as so solid and stable is, is much more malleable than we realize. Well, malleable is the word, and, and uh, I, I don't know, I haven't heard about that. I should look into what you just described, but the malleability point makes a lot of sense to me. For example, the, the dematerialization of milk phenomenon that took place in 1995, uh, which I write about in the book, and which, I again, I witnessed it. Uh, I, 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 I turned on the CNN one day. I don't have CNN anymore. But uh, I turned it on, and there was this British uh, a BBC reporter, and he's holding a cup of milk in his hand, and he's saying, this is happening all over and I'm going to give it a try right now. So he, he lifts a little cup of milk to the, uh, to the statue of Ganesha, the remover of obstacles. And uh, the camera focuses right on that milk. And I saw the milk. It didn't spill over. There was no capillary action as they try to explain it. The, I could just see that milk get, the amount of milk gets smaller and smaller and then disappeared. I will never forget the look of astonishment on the face of that BBC reporter. Uh, and then later on, I might add that uh, I, uh, I had two students of mine who were Indian uh, and in India and witnessed it. And they both wrote me papers detailing. One of them went on the line three times to make sure that what he was seeing was real. And he was absolutely clear about the fact that the milk simply dematerialized into nothing. So that shakes up your sense of, I mean, on the one hand, things from nowhere appear or materialize, and likewise, things tend, uh, disappear. I mean, there's a the whole phenomenon of the ports in, media, in physical mediumship that we hear about uh, very often, where things appear and disappear. That gives us a very malleable sense of physical reality. But in general, I think it's fair to say that it, when these events occur in a religious context, it leaves people with a, a positive sense of awe. Uh, it, for most of the people, it's, it's a confirmation of, of their faith. I myself feel uh, buoyed up in spirit when I read about these things. But in, in a general way, I feel... I write somewhere in the book uh, that my collection of miracles is like I view it as a kind of commons 
for human experience, for the, for the human being to peer into from time to time, just as a reminder of what extraordinary potentialities we human beings possess. And, and, and it's totally unpredictable how those extraordinary realities may manifest themselves uh, through the mind, through bodily transformations. So I'm, I, there's a source of optimism uh, that I derive, uh, which is not unlike the religious person who feels that his or her belief system is supported or confirmed by, by a miracle. Uh, mine is too, but mine is a more universal belief system. I, I'm not, I, I think all religions, like all styles of doing art, are, are valid. And uh, if you happen to have been born, I was born a Catholic, so I'm naturally uh, more knowledgeable and uh, aware of, of, that, uh, of that particular form of, of, of religiosity. But I don't think it's the only in, uh, form. Wouldn't you say, uh, as a whole, that these r religious experiences, these miracles, form uh, part of a spectrum that includes poltergeist cases, spiritualistic phenomena, and even laboratory uh, cases of extrasensory perception? That they all, all seem to be part of a larger continuum of uh, human paranormal experience. Absolutely. That's precisely my view. And I try to explain how I use the word miracle, partly for rhetorical purposes. The root of the word goes back to Sanskrit and means smile. I thought that was cool, right? Smile of the universe. And uh, But uh, it, it, the universe smiles at us in various ways. It, it, some of the biggest laughs come through religion. But as you say, mediumship and just every day, I would hesitate to call uh, a, a call it a miracle when I get an impression of somebody and then the phone rings, it's them. And that happens to me often. It would be uh, a little overstated to call that a miracle. But it is part of that continuum of extraordinary extra physical phenomena uh, that uh, uh, we find in so many different shapes and forms in human experience. So I completely agree with that uh, uh, point that you make. Uh, the, the miracles are, and the, the use of the term, as I say, is partly rhetorical uh, and partly to point also to the most extravagant manifestations. But the entire spectrum is implied, beginning with the mind itself. Remember, consciousness, as we know, is one of the riddles of science. Even your toughest materialists tough-minded materialists admit that they cannot explain uh, consciousness uh, and reduce it to any f physical process. So yes, uh, it is a, a major spectrum. And I want to include the UFO universe uh, because it too is uh, reflects aspects of this unknown dimension of reality that we seem to be immersed in. Over 20 years ago, I interviewed you on your book, The Final Choice. And, mm -hmm. and as I recall at that time, you, you were suggesting that there was an increase in, in phenomena like, uh, because uh, there was a huge focus at, at that time, I recall, on near-death experiences and that, mm -hmm. uh, they were occurring in, in greater numbers now because of the fact that humanity was, was facing a crisis that because of our technology, we had the, the power to destroy ourselves for the first time in human history. Uh, now, looking back on that hypothesis now, do you still feel the same way? Well, I have a general feeling that the near-death experience can be used as a model for a variety of, of phenomena, where uh, whether it be illness or a, a group crisis, uh, and I think that, uh, I do, I still have that notion. In fact, I re, in my rewriting of my, of the final choice, I do talk about the notion of a global near death experience, the possibility and what that might mean. And as things are right now, <laughs> I, 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 I find myself thinking about it even more. Uh, and, and it's really, 
It's simply the, the notion that uh, paranormal events seem to take place when our ordinary, everyday relationship to the external world is uh, out of whack. Uh, it, it could be something, it could be illness, it could be uh, some kind of an emergency, a near-death experience, uh, solitude, it could be deliberate. The, the yogis who isolate themselves, the monks who live alone, their relationship to the world around them is um, a distressed or intense in some way. And with the world, the way it's evolving right now under so many pressures, so many challenges, I find myself again wondering and with my eyes open and ears open uh, and looking for signs of uh, a creative breakthrough in a general way, okay? That's a term I, and it may and may not be explicitly paranormal or involving blatant kinds of miracles, but people are in, in, in the current uh, uh, pandemic crisis are being forced to think in new ways. I haven't heard, uh, I mean, radically new ways. I haven't heard any stories yet of, uh, unusual psychic experiences, but that doesn't mean they're not taking place. So in a general sense, I do feel that um, these extraordinary potentials, which I have concluded are part of our latent human nature, uh, I, I, I may very well express themselves uh, at some point in our future history where things get really, really bad, and that they, and those uh, sort of um, manifestations of these various kinds of psycho-spiritual powers may be part of a new phase of civilization. But that's, you know, again, it's a speculative idea based upon examples in the past where it takes place, but I'm generalizing it. I like to generalize the idea to a global level because it's hard not to think about what's happening globally right now. Uh, I mean, the uh, God, uh, the heat waves in Siberia. Uh, that's what you know. Uh, uh, it's it's a very strange time to be alive. Uh, and uh, I wrote a book on the millennium myths some years ago, and I pointed out. Uh, you know, all the times that there were predictions of the end of the world, and of course, never happened. And well, we, we are now living through what may very well be the first early stages of a major uh, collapse of world civilization, which is a phrase I, I, I hear uh, Noam Chomsky is talking about the end of the world these days, okay? Uh, the end of the civilized world. So it's not so fantastic to think along those lines. But unlike Noam, whom I adore as a, as a teacher and a philosopher, uh, I have this additional um, ace up my sleeve, so to speak, the belief in, uh, in our supernormal potentials as a species. Well, Michael Grosso, I know you've been studying these phenomena for, uh, as I have, for a half century or more. So yes, yes. <laughs> you have you have much more perspective on it than most people do, and and I'm very grateful to have had uh, this time with you to uh, talk about religious miracles. It's uh, really very refreshing and very inspiring at, at the same time, Michael. So thank you so much for being with me. Well, thank you very much. I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Hope we can do it again sometime. And for those of you viewing, thank you for being with us.